Lord's, and everything in it. He founded it on the seas, and established it on the waters. He holds the mountain in his hands, and his love reaches to the depths of the earth. The heavens declare his glory, the skies proclaim his beauty. And still, you have redeemed me, you have called me by name, I am yours. Awake, my soul, for your faithfulness endures forever. I will lift my eyes, for you are my help. I will lift my hands to praise you. I will lift my heart, for you are my salvation. I will lift my voice to proclaim all you have done. I will sing, I will dance, I will lift up a shout. I come to worship you. Hey, good morning, church. Hey, I am Cassie, and I want to welcome you both here in-house and those of you online. We would love to connect with you. If you happen to be new or visiting, or maybe you've been here a few times and want to learn more about Hope, you can meet me out these doors and by that red banner following the service. I'd love to get to know you and chat and show you the building if you'd like. And if you're online, they're going to drop a form right now, a link that you can fill out that we can connect with you. We would love to do that. And I also, I have to thank you, as we start gearing up for this summer that is jam-packed with a ton of events, I am so thankful for your generous giving throughout this last year that has allowed us to continue ministry without stopping throughout this last year. And so if you want to participate in giving, the best thing you can do is to grab an envelope from the seat pocket in front of you. It has all the info on it if you want to give online or text to give or drop it in the kiosk on your way out. And if you're online, if you've been watching online and want to participate in giving, you can fill out, uh, go to the link they are going to drop right now, and uh, you can just click on that and it'll get you all the details. All right, let me pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for this beautiful Sunday that we can gather, that we can worship. Father, would we be so aware of your presence? God, would we slow for a moment to worship and hear from you? God, and we will give you all the glory as you meet with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, you can go ahead and stand. And the first song that we're going to be singing is Multiplied, so feel free to worship with us today.
worshiping you freely. And God, I pray for anyone that came in this room today carrying any baggage, whether that's depression, fear, anxiety, whatever it may be, God. I pray that you take it and you remind us that you have it and you know the end, God. And God, with what we learned today, I pray that we can take it and use it in a way that will further your kingdom. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Richie Ford, and I minister to the children and the families here at Hope. Well, this morning, we have the opportunity, the privilege, to participate in a parent-child dedication with a family that is here with us this morning. Listen, Jesus says in Luke 12, 48, that from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. One of the greatest responsibilities any of us can bear is when the Lord entrusts children to our care. Because we recognize the great blessing and responsibility of children here at Hope, we offer parents the opportunity to participate in a parent-child dedication. Parent-child dedication is a declaration of a parent's intent to raise their child to know and love Jesus. It's an also an opportunity for parents to submit to the authority of Jesus, dedicating back to God that which he has given them. Parent-child dedication is an act of accountability between the family and the church to work together so that their child will be inspired to become fully alive in Jesus Christ. Today we have a family that has taken that step of formally dedicating themselves and their child to the Lord. This morning, 
they will publicly declare that promise to you. Parker and Stephanie Tumanek are bringing Vivian Ray Tumanek. What a picture. You guys can come on front and center. Very nice picture, as always. Parker and Stephanie, I call your attention to the commands of God recorded in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, or we could even say, hear, Tuminic family. The Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children, on your daughters. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Parker, Stephanie, you are to love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and teach Vivian to do the same. As you in your daily lives love God and one another, you will model before Vivian a wonderful life of dedication to and love for God that she will want for herself. You know, she's doing very good, by the way, for now. We had this little conversation beforehand where I said, okay, Parker, you know, while we're going through the Christian parents' covenant, you know, I'll ask you to hold Vivian as a symbol of spiritual leadership and he said i'll try but she's a mama's girl that's what mama said everything's going well now i just jinxed it <laughs> parker and stephanie you have already made a promise to follow the christian parents covenant here at hope you will now confirm these promises in front of the congregation declaring your intentions for your family and just so you guys know the reason we do all of this in front of you is like I just mentioned earlier, this is an act of accountability. So this family is saying, hey, when you see us three months from now getting coffee, would you check in on us? Say, hey, how, how's that little one doing? Three years from now, same thing. In a way, this is what they're asking us as the church, just so you know. So Parker and Stephanie, do you promise to dedicate yourselves to God, to pursue him first, and to living in a way that Vivian will witness in you a lifestyle of following Jesus? As part of the body of Christ, you're at hope. Do you promise your involvement in the many ministry opportunities, both to be served and to serve? In order to honor God and live his best for your life, do you promise to honor your marriage vows? which will also provide a strong foundation of family for Vivian? Do you promise to discipline Vivian in love in order for her to develop the discernment to make wise choices that honor God? And do you promise to pray for and guide Vivian with the end goal of accepting Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior? Church family, if you're comfortable, would you join with me and extend a hand as we pray a prayer of blessing over this family. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the Tuminic family. I don't want to pray right now first for Parker and Stephanie. I pray that your spirit would be over them as the caretakers of this family. Would you help them to love you, to trust you with all their heart, to grow with you daily as your servants as parents of these little ones. And we lift Vivian Ray to you, Lord, and I pray that as she grows, she would just have a sense within her from the power of your spirit, Jesus, that she would know your spirit, God, has made her. And it's your breath, Father, that gives her life. And may she just grow in her understanding of you and seeing you modeled uh, to her from her parents. Bless this family, Jesus, we pray it in your name. Amen. Well, listen, let's congratulate the Tuminics here. And let's continue as a church family, okay, not only to lift them up in prayer, but every once in a while to say, hey, how are you guys doing? How is it going? All right. Before you guys go, we do have some gifts for you uh, and Vivian from your church family, as well as a certificate of today's commitment. Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, sir.
Well, at this time, kids, grades K through 5, you are dismissed right out here to the doors to my right. Uh, parents, if you're new today, feel free to walk with your kids to see where they're going and where you will pick them up. Also, if you have any little ones with you that tend to maybe get a little bit restless, uh, we'd encourage you to take advantage of either the nursery or the mom's room, the parents' room, where you can view the service on the TVs in there. Thank you. Okay, I don't, I don't know uh, about you, but I feel like, I feel like we should feel spoiled when we had the worship that we just had. Yes, can we give it up for them? Wow. Oh, gosh, I mean, I, every week I'm reminded what a talented group of people I get to work with, and um, I mean, it's just, it's amazing. Um, I don't know. Some of you may know, some of you may not, but from like last fall to earlier this winter, Remy and Annalise, they participated in an internship here in the, the worship department. And it was my first time running anything like that. So, I mean, I have no, I have no idea if they learned anything. Um, but I do know, I think they did. Um, but I do know that I personally had a, a fantastic time getting to know them and and just like watching them up here, just lead, lead worship, it was like, uh, okay. It was really quite good. Um, and who knows, after your next internship, girls, you might be up here preaching, okay? So, next time. Uh, if you're newer around here, my name is Jared Edwards, and I'm the director of music and media here. And uh, I've been here at Hope for over 11 years now. So... Um, my background is, I grew up in Kansas. That's a quick sentence. We can just move right on past. <laughs> Cares? <laughs> I moved to Phoenix when I was uh, 19, and I lived there for 15 years. And then in 2010, we decided to get out of the desert, and we came here. And here we are. I mean, it's fine. I just, what I'm saying is, I have not acclimated to the Wisconsin weather, and I don't plan on it. It doesn't... <laughs> doesn't make sense to the human body, to me. Uh, so while I was in Arizona, um, I attended um, Arizona, I was going to say I studied at Arizona State, but come on, I attended Arizona State University, and when I was there, I met this girl named Alyssa, and Alyssa and I were friends for uh, a couple years, and then after some medium to strong hints from her, I asked her out, and uh, I mean, she was right then. And she's, she's been right every day since. Uh, I mean, there was this one time that she wasn't right. <laughs> then I thought about it, and I was like, nope, you're right. I'm, I'm wrong. All right, let's get into the message. I actually have quite a bit to say because they only let me have this microphone like once every four or five years. And uh, I'm not complaining. I'm serious. I mean, this is not my comfort zone. 
I mean, I could get up here and just like talk and say nothing for like a while uh, and feel real good about it. Um, but the hard work is getting together thoughts and information and, and a message that will hopefully bring you along to, to something that you are happy that you came here for. Um, so let's get into this whole thing. We're going to try to do that. In this series, okay, we're talking about renewal by remembering, right? And guess what? The obvious thing is you remembered to come here today, okay? You remembered that you enjoy worship here on Sunday morning, and that's something that you hopefully like, okay? You come here every week, here you are. So today, I want to get into this beautiful thing that renews us called worship. And when I get a little bit nervous, my nose runs, so I brought this, and I'm using this mic so you don't have to listen to that noise when that does happen, so... Let's go to the first slide. What is worship? Okay. This is a little definition I came up with. Worship is the position of awe and adoration of what we will forever fail to fully understand or emulate. Okay. Worship. Let's see. Just read through it quick or slow. Worship is the position of awe and adoration of what we will forever fail to fully understand or emulate. So if we think about that. When we lowercase w worship something or someone, whether it's like a sports figure or a person in the arts or some tech genius, whatever it is, if we examine it, the thing that makes that person so alluring or interesting is that we could really never do what they do, right? There's even a little bit of mystery about how they operate on that level, okay? But sometimes we're like, oh man, that person doesn't even seem human, okay? Now when we, on the other, other side, when we can do a thing, pretty much on the level of someone else, there's no wowness happening, right? So in that situation, that's just, that's not worship. That's just us looking at another person, right? So now let's point that logic in the direction of the creator God, okay? So we see this described in the Bible, so many instances of adoration and worship. And sometimes the worship is grandiose, right? In the language of like where the writer depicts scenes of the throne of God, where there's these amazing heavenly beings, angels, like bowed down before God with just like face to the ground, crying holy, 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 just hoping that they can inch a little bit closer to the throne where this amazing, powerful being of light and love is there, okay? And other times we get this like genuine intimacy in the writing. You know, like with David in the Psalms, there's a, the presence and the spirit of God. He comes closer than close with comfort and healing. Page turn, also this. <laughs> now, Samuel, he was a prophet for Israel, okay? And he was responsible for naming David to be the second king of Israel. Now, if you read Samuel's story of communion with God, it starts when he was real, real little. Okay, that's a cool story in and of itself. And God called him to be the voice uh, to the people of Israel. And so here's an example of Samuel's worship. 2 Samuel 7, 21 through 22, because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no God besides you according to all that we have heard with our ears. Now, I chose this verse because of the phrase, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. So let's just think about the beauty of that one phrase there. He's saying all this greatness, all the good, the bad, the ugly, you brought it about so that I could get to know your heart and your promises. But he uses that, that word servant. Okay, so Samuel remembers his place in all of it, a place of humility. Okay, he's not saying, for there's none like me, and good job on recognizing that God. He's saying, there's none like you. Hey, I think that's important in our worship, to remember that. The next verse is from Job, and it points more to the immeasurable quality of God. Job 11, 7 through 9. Can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They're as high as the heavens. What can you do? I love that question. What are you going to do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Now, Sheol, let's just pause. Sheol was... The Old Testament writers, um, when they, this was the like place of just dark where all souls went after life, okay? So there was, uh, no one had come back from there, from 
what they knew, so what can you know? So there was a lot of mystery there. Its measurement is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. I love this verse because it still tracks even after all these centuries, okay? Because even though we can explore space, even though we've mapped the earth in its entirety for the most part, we could probably calculate with, you know, some accuracy how many gallons of water is in the ocean. With all of that, we're still so small, right? And the, the earth is still so big. And the creator of it all is still worthy of our worship. And also, I love the ocean as, uh, as a picture of God in our worship. And I've shared this before, I think, but uh, I'll share it again. When I think of the ocean, um, just how massive it is, all right? It's, it's mostly unknown. It's mostly unexplored. I mean, the ocean's force is unmatched in its power, okay? And you can't help but pay attention to it. And when you're up close to it, no wave looks the same. But as a whole, it's constant, right? And the sound of the waves, there's like nothing like it on the earth, right? I mean, maybe, uh, maybe I'm a weirdo for this, but when I am hanging out by the ocean, I always find myself spending a few minutes thinking about how the ocean waves have been making, like crashing there and making that sound like so, 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 so long before I was ever a thought. And then they're just going to be like keep doing that so, so, so long after I'm dead. I mean, ah, that's beautiful, isn't it? I don't know. Take that with you. You know, go to the beach with that. I think that's, that's worthy, worthy of your time. But when we walk on the beach, right, the ocean, with all that water out there, all that power and all that mystery, eventually what it does is it just it comes up and it just like dances and splashes around your toes, right? Like with this super, just gentleness. To me, that's like a worship service, all right? So God in all of his mystery, his power, his timelessness, meets us at a heart level during the chorus of like a thousand little songs. And I think that's pretty amazing. So as good and wonderful as all that sounds, you know, sometimes if we're real honest, um, sometimes it just feels like we're going through the motions, right? It feels like we're just singing some songs and can we sit back down, that kind of thing. And I get that. But I want to talk about that just a little bit. What limits our worship? And to me, this is, this is kind of what I want to talk about. Our certainty, now we'll get into that word certainty, of who we believe God to be will stunt our wonder, curiosity, and worship. Let's look at Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it would be paid back to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So this verse perfectly sets up what I really want us to think about this morning. And that is, we can't know all of God. And, and I know we know this, and I know we'd probably be the first to admit it verbally. But I believe, whether we want to admit it or not, that we, that we often operate within the confines of being a human in the 21st century, okay? Our cultural DNA is one of knowing things, knowing the hard facts, okay? To know and be certain of something, actually, it really brings us intellectual security and safety, and that trickles right into our emotions, okay? So it's helpful for us to, like, be very certain of something, okay? I mean, ever since the printing press started kicking out books, including the Bible, our, uh, our collective thirst to get to the root of all things that were previously mysterious has been unrelenting. And I'm, I'm really here for it, okay? Because all of that thirst for knowledge has brought us everything from electricity to our iPhones, right? I mean, because some of our fellow humans, okay, 
have been insatiable regarding concrete and provable knowledge in their fields of study, we can like walk onto this multi-ton Airbus and fly up into the heavens, okay, and look down on the clouds. We have extensive knowledge about how the body works. We can get in there, we can help things operate a little bit smoother, maybe a little bit longer, right? I mean, math and science and technology have given us luxuries that only royalty could have ever dreamt of just decades ago. The technology that we hold in our hands, I mean, no person, no person that lives out, lived outside the 20th century could even imagine what a cell phone could do today. But here's my thoughts on this. I think we've taken this attitude of knowing and being certain and applied it to our Christian faith. Now, don't get me wrong. We can, we can and we should be absolutely certain of the goodness of God. We just sang about that. And we can absolutely be certain that we can stand on the rock of Jesus as the capital W, Word of God, who speaks. And we can be certain about the Spirit of God moving in love and grace across this entire planet. However, I think if we, I think if we really think about it, we've drawn our own parameters and we've built our own walls and we've called them holy as humans. We spend a lot of time spiritualizing the rhythms of normal human and cultural relations and we've chosen sides according to our very biased interpretations of what we think God is thinking. And so you know what happens when we think that we know the boundaries of God's love, his rules and his thoughts? That's the exact moment that we've created an idol. I'm pretty sure there's a commandment that speaks pretty strongly about that, right? See, we can't define the undefinable, and we can't catch the uncatchable, and we can't fully imagine the unimaginable. When our imagination ceases to operate, mystery immediately dies. And it's at that moment that our view of God becomes outdated, and we're now calling a single wave the ocean. See, where there is no wonder, there is no worship. The moment that we think we have everything all figured out is the same exact moment we've stopped worshiping the holy God. And yes, we have doctrines and we have theologies and we need those, absolutely. It tells us the story about how we're interacting with the triune God, right? But we forget that God is bigger than all of our own ideas, all of that. That stuff, it's important. It's like, it's like the light above your dinner table, right? Like you use it every day. It's helpful. Every once in a while, you probably need to change a bulb or two, uh, right? God is like the starry sky, you know? Even with our most powerful telescopes, we can't see everything. How many times a month do you gaze up at your dining room light, and you're just like, this thing is amazing. I mean, wow. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's maybe someone has a chandelier that's just like incredible, but for the most part, I don't want to look up to my dinner. I don't want to look up there because I'm like, I got a dust. That's, you know, again. But looking up at the stars and not seeing all that's there invites us to keep looking. So let's press into this a little bit more things we can end up worshiping instead of God, okay? One, idols. Deuteronomy 29, 17 through 18, you saw among them their detestable images and idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. Now, I know we often talk about uh, the obvious things in our lives that we put before God. And those things can and most certainly will hinder our worship, okay? Sometimes we need to operate in a time of confession and clear away some of that stuff. But what about the sneaky idols? 
you know, the ones that disguise themselves as godly, what makes you think of the eternal God that, you know, if you parse it out, it really has not a lot to do with God? Now, probably the most prevalent example that's in our culture today is uh, ugh, politics, right? Gross. It's brutal. We have to talk about it. Um, but, I mean, it's everywhere right now. And I think as a church, we need to think about that. And so let's just say this. Okay, if you think that God is cheering on one political person or party more than the other, you're probably holding some clay in your hand that is ripe for getting molded into an idol. I think somewhere along the way, we lost our ability to recognize nuance in one another. And honestly, um, I think we need to scratch and claw our way back to where we think of ourselves as Christians on planet Earth as our primary identity, first and foremost. Americans, after that, and probably party affiliation after that, maybe like three down the line. A.W. Tozer wrote, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. You've probably heard that quote before, but I'm going to read it one more time. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Number two, the things we can end up worshiping are experiences. All right, Matthew 7, 24 through 26. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock, though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. I'm going to do this one more time. I think then we'll be in the clear, yeah? So gross. Apologies, man. See you in five years. <laughs> anyway, I think this verse, uh, I think this verse can really speak to our desire, uh, and all of us have it, to recapture an event or set of events that happened in a landmark time in our lives. It's a little twisty there, but uh, you follow me, okay? Now, I know I'm probably speaking to uh, the folks that have a longer history in the faith. I've been in church since I was nine days old, uh, missed very few Sundays uh, along the way, and I'm uh, 45. So I have a history of being in church, and I've been affected powerfully by the music every step of the way. I have memories and experiences that have marked me forever, all right? There's songs that continue to find space in my personal time of reflection and worship that are defined by various generations of, of church music history. And those times and those songs absolutely should be celebrated from time to time. In fact, plug, in the beginning of August, we're going to have a worship concert in here where we're going to bring back a lot of those old favorites, and we're just going to have a party. Does that sound all right? Okay, good, good, good. All right, we got some applause on the back. All right. But I want to encourage us as worshipers to not chase that emotional experience, okay? God is certainly interested in our emotions. God is certainly interested. He created every fiber, everything about us, and we should engage all of that. But it's easy to kind of chase something, you know, that we experienced before. Like, oh, man, it's just not like that conference, or it's, you know, it's not like this meeting that we had, or it's not like church camp. Yeah, it's not like church camp. It sounds good, okay? Oh, hey, going to get an email. Um, but seriously, though, chase God. Chase the source of love, the source of peace, the giver of grace, the almighty, and the all-merciful. And as we do that, we'll continually be compelled to do what needs to be done to reach out to the next generation. A few years ago, we decided to implement these in-ear monitors that you see. And along with that, we also introduced tracks, okay, so that when young families or anyone uh, comes in to worship, 
the songs that you all hear on the radio, uh, they're somewhat replicated, right? And with that familiarity, there's a comfort. And with that comfort, hopefully uh, the distraction of discomfort is hopefully removed uh, in the worship experience. And it was an adjustment. Uh, it really was, because what you might not know is there's a constant metronome that goes on in here. Does anybody, who doesn't know what a metronome is, or who knows what a metronome, okay. So a metronome is, uh, let's just, I'll just, okay, here we go. Singers, don't leave me here, all right, we know this. I love you, Lord, yes, okay, and I lift my voice, all right, singers, keep going, ready? I love you, Lord, keep singing, and I... Yeah, all right, cool. So that's just like in your ear, just like so loud, right? Uh, the whole time. Um, and so give us grace a little bit, you know, when we crash and burn up here because we have a lot going on in our ears uh, to help us along the way. And the reason, the reason I asked the team to do this and to subject themselves to this is because I really believe that the Bible calls us to come out of our comfort zones for the edification of the church body. And that biblical idea, okay, that teaching, like this verse says, is the rock on which we worship, okay? So how do we find wonder in our worship? Well, we practice, 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 all right? Here's where we take it home, all right? And I almost did it. I almost talked for a while, okay, without talking about running, but I'm going to spoil it, so sorry. My name is Jared Edwards, and I like to run, okay? Confession. Uh, there's dozens of us, all right, just so you know. Um, so if you've ever spent some time implementing running into your life, you know that once you get past that phase of, why am I doing this to myself and in public, uh, you find that there's a mental space that's almost meditative. And so... When I run, I'm constantly thinking about like, okay, toes, what are you doing? Are you tensed up? Okay, hips, all right, oh, no, too far. Knees, okay, hamstring, engaged. Like there's always a check, and I'm constantly going through, like what's my head doing? Shoulders down, arms like this, okay. Like it's just over and over and over, systems check as I go down the road. And I don't know why I like it, but I like it, okay? That's it. But I firmly believe that when we practice like this, being grateful and paying for God's love and grace in our lives, our worship will absolutely come to life. Prayer and Bible study are important, of course, so let's just say that's on the list. Cool, we got it. Here's a few other ways in which I think we can get our minds and hearts ready for worship. One, let's just say the one we're talking about, uh, fruit the idols, Okay. Matthew 8, 22 through 23, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for the body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. When your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. This verse could not be more pertinent right now, am I right? I wish I could code this verse to just float on top of Facebook's feed, especially that last phrase, all right? This is a lifetime journey, everybody, okay? We must constantly be examining our thoughts, our beliefs, our preferences. Is this getting in the way of what God and who God is, all right? If we can do this with humility, we will not be able to ignore the goodness of God. The next thing, be ready. Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. I love this verse. It's basically saying hit the door out there by being thankful, okay? So your worship doesn't start after the announcements up here, okay? When Cassie prays and turns around, that's not when it starts, okay? So a couple months ago, I was talking to the teens uh, about this kind of thing, and I was asked to retell the analogy that I gave there. And so I was saying, we should think of worship our worship on Sundays as like a birthday party, okay? So when you go to a birthday party, you don't like walk in 
hang out for a little bit, and then you see the person whose birthday it is, and you're just like, what? <laughs> hey, you're here. I can't, uh, that's so great. I'm so glad you're here too. I was having cake, and, uh, but happy birthday, by the way, and also next week, probably going to get you a real nice gift. That's <laughs> such an awful way to go to a birthday party. How do you do that? You go prepared. Like, you've been thinking about that person already, okay? You thought about, okay, what kind of gift would they like, right? Maybe you wrapped it, maybe you put it in the bag. I think the bag's better. I don't know, just me. Maybe you've writ written out some of the thoughts that you have about them on a card, and you go in and you're ready to celebrate that person, okay? That's how we should treat our Sunday worship. All right, and if I may, can we quit saying, I love coming to church to get fed or to get my fix? Uh, not worship, okay? <laughs> That's, well, it's a worship of your needs and preferences. Also, sing. Can I say that? Okay. I'm up here, like, you know, 99% of the time, and I'm just singing. I mean, I have such a good time up here and the team, and everybody, and I see some hands raised, and I can hear voices and stuff like that. A little bit ago, I was out there, and I was um, listening, and I was like, where's the voice? Like, guys, come on. Get with me, man. You can sing too. I don't care. It doesn't matter if you're awesome or not. Just sing it out, okay? Soapbox over. And lastly, recognize the beauty in all things. Job 12, 7 through 10. But ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you or speak the truth and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. This is such a cool verse. I want to focus real quick on these last three words. Of all mankind. I think the greatest sin that we in this culture are guilty of right now is dehumanizing the other. What do I mean by that? I mean that we have a lower opinion of those that disagree with us and believe other ideas than, than we do, than we have of ourselves. So, and that makes them less than ourselves in our minds. This is not love. In fact, this is the beginning of the spirit of murder. We need to do whatever we need to do, okay? Delete the app, close the laptop, whatever it takes to stop seeing others by what makes them different from ourselves and start seeing them by what commonalities we have with each other. Do you need a place to start? Here's one. That person needs and craves to be loved. And if you look in our Bible, you can see Maybe you're the one to start that. Okay, breathe. Also, seek out the new and the interesting. There's beauty in that, all right? Some of you are real good at this. Some of you need people to kind of pull you along on this. Godly beauty is everywhere. When I was in the music program at ASU, we sang this song, and it was called When David Heard by Eric Whitaker. And it's a choral piece, and it's 15 minutes, and I'd like to play the whole thing for you right now. Just kidding. In a minute, I do want to play like two minutes. Um, but I found this version, and it's done by this guy. I mean, I'm going to go to the paragraph above. I'm a little creeped out by this guy, but he is amazing. And so I might, I don't know, for some of you, you're just like, yeah, it's a dude. For some of you, it might be like, he is a little weird, okay? But that's okay. Let's just give it a listen, okay?
that's cool I remember this one time when we sang that and there was you know it's a it's not just there's a bunch of people singing right and I looked over at my buddy uh, Mark who was in the same section as I was and he's kind of this like free spirit kind of dude kind of a partier and he had tears just like streaming down his face I'll never forget that see when we're open to the unexpected presence of God he is there and there's simply no doubt about that. And we have to stay in a place of wonder because where there is no wonder, there's no worship. I'm going to say there's two ways in which we can exist, all right? We can participate and we can spectate. And when it comes to worship, both are absolutely necessary. And this verse speaks to it, okay? The summer, this summer, I want you to spend some time on a walk or a hike or in your backyard or just, and just stop and listen spectate the beauty and practice it you're going to have to practice it because it takes a while to slow everything down to hear the song, the track of the birds like they're doing something they're saying something I guess listen to the bugs at night if you're next to a tree focus on the sound of the leaves moving also did you know it's a proven, proven fact that the sound of rushing water or moving water lowers your blood pressure so you're welcome. Soak it in and know that all of this, the very breath in your lungs is a gift from God. And worship the God that is breathing all that goodness. And bring that thanks, that sense of gratefulness with you as you walk in here through the doors on Sundays. Where you and where we all get to participate together in song and communion and confession and contemplation on the glory power of God. And what I like to do now is just spend a couple minutes and I just worship together. So let's stand and do that. And also just a quick reminder as you stand that if you want to pray around this or anything else, there'll be someone in the prayer room after this service. Let's sing this. And my life is yours. My hope is in you only, my heart you hold, so you made this in a holy and holy, sing holy, holy. your glory, because your glory is so beautiful, I fall onto my knees in awe, and the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your life, because your glory is so beautiful, because your glory is so beautiful. Yours. 
Sing it out. Right, lift your heart. Thank you for being a being of light, power, and beauty that we can forever seek. Thank you for finding us in our humanity and filling us up with your love and your grace. May we go from here in awe and in wonder of who you are, and may we always be in that place in your name. Amen. Thanks so much. Have a good uh, day.